Guys, I, um, I know I'm up here looking like a mountain man. You know why I'm looking like a mountain man? Because I've been in the mountains for a week, in Arizona on the border, finding crazy things. I'm going to report about it all week, but I'm going to go back. I'll tell you something. About a year and a half ago, I started to really learn about the border and go down to the border, and I started finding crazy things that people on the border, like these guys who serve and keep us safe from the border patrol. There are things down there that they, they see all the time. And see, they report it, they file the right reports, and they know what's going on. And the communities down there know what's going on. Except apparently the mayor of El Paso. <laughs> but the communities down there know what's going on, and the Border Patrol agents see what's going on. And I began to understand that they would tell their bosses what was going on. And then what their bosses would say to the media wasn't the same thing. How many of you can believe that? Especially under this administration. Yeah. Well, so I began to associate Andrew Breitbart's hatred of bullies, right? And his desire to stick up for those who were doing the right things, like he did the Tea Party movement. Yeah. Yeah, but we're getting attacked by the media and by the administration. And I began to see the men and women of Border Patrol, not the agency and the political appointees and way up top and the CBP and all that, but I began to see the men and women of Border Patrol who were out there on the lines getting dirt on the boots, right? I began to see them as a group of people doing the right things who were getting attacked by media and who were getting attacked by the administration. So I began to feel this natural desire to understand it more and to defend them. And I used to try to defend them and no one seemed to care. And then, man, over time, after just chipping away at it and telling the stories that were going on from the border and the cartels and, and the slain Border Patrol agents who were murdered on the line of duty, who were then disrespected by the administration and disrespected by the media, I began to see more and more people get excited about this story and care about it. And it wasn't until a very honorable Border Patrol agent leaked to me 40 some odd photos that we published. How many of you saw those photos? A bunch of you saw them. Of these minors, most of them were, were kids, but in that particular set of photos. But these minors in these facilities, that all of a sudden everybody started to really talk about it more. And so to go from just going down to the border, scared, not knowing what to expect, and finding these people that I thought we really needed to defend, who defend us, and do the right thing, who are being treated wrong, and then just come in here and have two, two I think, heroes who risk their lives every day. <laughs> to have them here, and then to have the movement that I love here, it's very touching. And I appreciate that each one of you came. I hope tonight, we had a video we wanted to show you, but I can tell you all about it a little later. First, we're going to have these two men up here to talk. Both of them are from the Border Patrol. They're also from the Union, and we're on the right. We're like, we don't like unions. I'm going to tell you something. I don't like unions. I like their union. The National Border Patrol Council is voluntary. That matters, right? And let me tell you something. Border Patrol agents can tell me what's going on all day long, but I can't always report what someone told me without saying their name. The only reason any of us know what is going on on that border is because the union has spoken out for the men and women. So we can hate unions all we want, whatever we say, but I'm going to tell you what, these guys, they're doing something all across the country. They're fighting for the men and women who serve, who are getting attacked by media, and who are getting attacked by what are dominantly left of center interests, right? Who want open borders, they hate the Border Patrol, they demonize them. So we're going to have them up today, and they're going to tell you about their experiences and what the men and women on the border go through. And then I'm going to come back up, and I'm going to tell you what I've seen, and I'm going to tell you what I know in my heart and in my mind from my experience 
what has mattered to the hundreds of Border Patrol agents I've encountered while I've been out there on that border, traveling from sector to sector, asking people what's going on. So with that, I'm going to invite a spokesperson for the Laredo local to come on up from the National Border Patrol Council. He is a Border Patrol agent who I believe is a canine agent. He's not a canine, he has a canine. He stops narcotics and human traffickers from coming in. Hector, would you please come up? Hector, Thank you very much for the applause. And I'm pretty much overwhelmed by the welcome here in the grapevine. And I'm very happy to be here and be able to share our story uh, that the men and women of the Border Patrol are living on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, like Brandon mentioned, uh, we are Border Patrol agents and we do work the line, we do work the, the border on a daily basis. Uh, just this morning I got to work at like 8 in the morning, uh, working the, uh, the border. Uh, we did have some apprehensions this morning. Uh, we got out of work and, and flew out here to Dallas to uh, be able to meet with you and we thank you for the invitation. We are facing a very difficult situation at the border. Uh, it's a porous border. Uh, at this point, you know, our, our borders are not secure. Uh, the history of the Border Patrol in the past, uh, prior to 911, the, uh, the trafficking organizations and, and the immigration uh, uh, crossers and the illegal agents that were crossing, they used to cross with mom and pop type of human smuggling organizations. Uh, people would just kind of come up to the border and they would basically cross on their own without uh, a drug cartel organization. Now that has changed now. Now nobody can cross the border without going to the drug cartels. Uh, we are facing a very dangerous uh, adversary. Uh, they are well funded, uh, they are dangerous, and they do not care for human life. For that reason, our situation is becoming very dire. Um, we have a very porous border. Uh, we are seeing uh, very dangerous criminals coming into our, into our country. Uh, the administration does not support border patrol agents. Uh, I want to mention that I'm not a professional spokesperson, so please bear with me. <laughs> so, uh, but I do speak for the men and women of the Border Patrol. Now, uh, we ask uh, your support. Uh, we have a lot of congressmen, a lot of Texas leaders here. Uh, where we meet with our Border Patrol leaders on a, on a monthly basis, uh, with our union meetings, and we welcome uh, our congressmen and we welcome our, our Texas leaders and even potential can our candidates for the state, for the state, state of Texas to come over to our meetings and listen to the real border security experts. Now, in Laredo, Texas, we have a very difficult situation because our resources and our manpower uh, are being reassigned for these processing duties. I know most of you guys have heard some of these statements that are made out there. And what, that, what, what is happening is that we're having a very porous border. And the, uh, the family units and the children, they are crossing in the Laredo area. But what is happening is that as our border patrols are tied up with these family units, and these uh, alien children that are pretty much surrendering themselves because they know they're being in the street passing to our country. While that is happening, we have the dangerous criminals and those dangerous drugs that are crossing. Now, the job of Border Patrol agents is very, is very important because we're not only protecting our border. Uh, if we don't stop these criminals at our border, they're coming into, into the state of Texas and they're coming to our country and they're going to harm us. Now, a lot of people think that a lot of these aliens just come here to work. That's a myth. Uh, we get a lot of criminals that come here to harm our, our families, our, our, our communities, and there are killing our people and, and committing all these dangerous activities. Uh, I do want to ask you to please keep your, uh, please keep uh, Agent Vera's uh, family in your prayers. Agent Vera was killed uh, last week in the Kingsville area while he was on a fishing trip with his family. Uh, two legal aliens actually uh, attempted to rob him and his family. Uh, he was able to uh, return gunfire, and unfortunately, uh, Agent Vega was murdered in front of his two kids, his wife, and his parents. Um, so I ask you to keep his family in his prayers. Uh, I also ask you to keep uh, Brian Terry's family in his prayers, uh, Robert Rosas. Uh, those are some of the agents that have been murdered by legal aliens and by drug cartels. Now, uh, Agent Vega acted like any law enforcement uh, would have responded. Uh, Agent Vega. Not only protect his family that day, but he also protect his community. And because of his because of his murder now, uh, it has brought more attention to this crisis. And we hope that his name, uh, his murder, will not be in vain. And we hope that we can uh, actually make a difference and make our voices heard. Uh, we do look forward for uh, for the Q and A session. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, uh, 
when you guys uh, ask the questions later on today, uh, we will give you uh, very good details. Uh, you can ask as many questions as you want. Uh, and at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my partner, uh, Jared Seeley, uh, who's also a spokesperson with the National Board Virtual Council. Uh, just want to say thank you very much for uh, standing up. I, I don't, and have never ever really ever considered myself to be a hero. Just a guy that wanted to do a good job uh, protecting this country. I've been asked to speak to you about the morale of the Border Patrol today. And um, like my, my brother Hector here, basically, uh, we're, in a, we're in a pretty bad spot. Notice the gentleman with the Border Patrol hat out there today. Uh, you know, that does, that does wonders for us. I, I like to see that. Um, but unfortunately, you know, we're getting beat up, coming and going, uh, from our management, from the administration, uh, and even from the, the smugglers that are going ahead and running these alien groups. <coughs> Hector Garza spoke about Brian Terry, and uh, that, that hits home for a lot of us because this guy was out there just doing his job, and he got killed doing it by guns that were placed in, in criminals' hands. Uh, Agent Vega, another great guy, you know, can't speak more highly of him, laid down his life trying to protect his family. Who wouldn't do that? What we face on a day-to-day -day basis is basically we have men and women that are sworn enough to go out there and do that job, to stand on the line, middle of the night, inclement weather, and to protect you guys, our families, from anything that wants to come across that border and hurt you. And it's a difficult job, 112 degree heat. It's, it's horrible. And anybody that tells you that the border is secure, that there's no holes, that nobody's getting through, I'm a border patrol agent. <laughs> that couldn't be further from the truth. The border is not secure. People can come through. They're not just Mexicans. They're not just Central Americans. They're Middle Eastern people. They're terrorists. They're criminals. And these are the type of people that perpetrate crimes against Americans. And that's what we want to stop. take an interest in what we're facing every day. Um, so thank you. The one thing that I, I just want to mention as well while I'm up here is, is that I'm very fortunate to have, and I call them brothers and sisters because that's exactly what they are. We rally around each other. Uh, it's, our only family that some of us have. I, I know that you guys are probably going to beat me up from it. I'm, I'm from Massachusetts. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not from Texas, but Texas is my home. Yeah. Just like anybody else wants to protect their home, that's what I want to do too. And our guys out there want to go out there and do that job. They want to protect their home as well. And when we get taken off the line, when we get told that we can't work anymore, sent home, despite the fact that we can, we're just within a grasp of catching these aliens and catching these criminals, and they say, no, I'm sorry, you have to go home because the clock's passed a certain amount of time. And I bet you, I mean, it's a job, and I'm sure that the guys want to get paid, but most of these guys, they're not worried about going home when that clock hits the eighth hour. 10, 11, 12, 13, 15, 16 hours these guys are working away from their families, away from their children, just to make sure that they do their job, do their due diligence to get the job done. And you're really fortunate, we're really fortunate to have such a professional uh, border patrol that, that has such a great work ethic that wants to go out there and make things right. So what I'd like to ask each and every one of you is, is that when you see a Border Patrol man, or you see a uh, congressman in Congress and they, they don't give us the tools that we need, it, it kills our morale. And you ask the question, why? Why are we going out there and doing this? When my guys are out there in the middle of the night and they could use a helicopter, it would be great to have one. But our leadership has decided that that helicopter is best off at a baseball game 
so people can take pictures in front of it. <laughs> Same type of thing. This happens last week, Laredo, Texas. We have guys, boats, there's a river. That's the only thing that separates us from Mexico. Our boats are on a trailer at a baseball field. Our ATVs that are an unbelievable force multiplier for us. We can respond faster, cover more ground. They're on a trailer at a baseball field. It's demoralizing because we're out there willing to do the job, wanting to do the job, but just don't have the tools to do it. I, uh, I encourage you guys to get out there and, and continue what you're doing. We appreciate everything that you do for us. Um, I know labor unions are not on a, on a big, huge thing with you guys, but... <laughs> When you I, go back to Laredo, you tell them we support you and we thank you. And we do. Thank you. I just, I just want to close real quickly, and I'm in a real fortunate position, and basically I became the vice president of the local 2455 because I didn't like the way things were going. I stood up, and then I had to put my money where my mouth was. And uh, this is where I find myself speaking to a great group of people like this. But I do want to say on behalf of the 1,400 agents of Laredo sector, we do appreciate this opportunity to come up here and speak with you tonight. We're going to try to give you as, as answer all your questions. And uh, God bless America. Thank you. Hey guys, there's so much to tell you, and I'm going to get so excited when I'm telling you, but we have something special. We decided at Bright Bark, Texas, that we would get together, we call Julie and Joanne, how many of you know Joanne? She's a good one, Joanne's funny. Yeah. Um, we called them, we asked them to get some people together, and we brought some grassroots leaders down to the Laredo sector. And I'm gonna give you a little history about that, a little geography if you don't know. But we brought leaders down to the Laredo sector to see it for themselves. And it was scary, wasn't it? A little frightening. We wanted them to feel what Border Patrol agents feel like out there at night. So we put ourselves in some dangerous spots. But it's the same dangerous spots that Border Patrol agents put themselves in alone every night. So we brought these leaders down there. And the reason we picked Laredo, not just because these two men are, are great guys, but the reason we picked Laredo is because of this. And this is where, where is Congressman Burgess? Is, is he still here? He had to go. He had to go. Well, that's a shame because I don't like to talk about people when they're not here. I'm going to tell you something. What he said wasn't true. 90% of it was completely false. I wish our political leaders would shut up, come and listen, instead of using this as a, as a, that, that makes me mad. Please, please stand up. This is one of the most amazing cartel reporters. He's not a cartel member. He works on the cartels. Il Difonso is from Mexico. He's a legal citizen. Don't worry, I'm not pulling a fast one on you. He lives here. His family had to leave Mexico. His dad had, man, his dad had to leave his ranch because of the Zetas. Was it the Zetas or the Gulf? The Zetas. Yeah, wasn't safe anymore. The ranch is fine. He just can't travel on the roads. You know? So he's here, he's a reporter, and he ruthlessly reports on cartels. At Breitbart, Texas, we put our money where our mouth is, and we've been hiring reporters along the border. We're starting to develop sources in Mexico to report on these evil people, these cartels. I'm not sure if they're going to appreciate that. But you know what? I don't care. I want to tell you something. I promise you that Il Defanzo, since he does work at Bright Park, Texas, and I'm the director, I can say this. He will be writing about the fact that that congressman just showed up, spewed a bunch of false information, and left. Yeah. Did, anybody notice, did anybody notice that he at least had the decency to wait until these men from the Border Patrol who just came up here from Laredo? Do you both have families? You have families, right? Right, so you have families. Now, I know for a fact, Hector, you worked last night. What hours did you work? I left work at 9 in the morning. You left work at 9 in the morning. You got to Dallas at 10. At 12, I'm sorry. 
okay, to come and speak to these people. Did that congressman have the respect to wait until he was done? Anyone? Okay. Enough said. So the numbers are down right now. And they're not down. The numbers are down from how high they were, right? Let's be clear about that. They're down because it's the summertime. Every summer the numbers go down. That would be like saying, you know, like, hey, it's not hot anymore. We don't need air. Let's not worry about fixing the air conditioner. It's December and it's not hot anymore. The heat has gone away. It's like, no, the heat didn't go away. It's winter. It's coming right back. It's a cycle, people. It's a cycle. My goodness, man. So we're going to write about that because I don't appreciate somebody coming here and making a photo op for themselves, taking time from, well, from these men and taking time from me. I don't appreciate it. And taking time from you so they can spew a bunch of stuff that isn't accurate. Ask me what I think about the National Guard on the border. Ask me. What do you think about the National Guard? I'm glad you asked. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I support the men and women in the National Guard. I appreciate what they're doing. And I appreciate that the state of Texas did a symbolic gesture to send people down there. I really do. But how many of you, when you heard Governor Perry talking and Dewhurst and Strauss, how many of you heard them say, we're going to secure the border, we're going to send these thousand guards? Did they tell you in that? Because maybe I missed it. But I'm going to tell you something. As a guy who spent a year and a half down there and that dirty stuff, getting ticks and hit chickers and itching and all the scary times I had out there along the whole border, and as a guy who like tries to, to do everything I can for these guys because they do everything they can for us, you know, that press conference offended me. And I'll tell you why. The Rio Grande Valley sector is 25% of Texas border. There are five, right, five border patrol sectors in the state of Texas. There are nine on the board, U.S. border with Mexico, okay? The Rio Grande Valley sector is a small part of the U.S.-Mexico border. It is a small part, it is one quarter, of the Texas border with Mexico. How many of you realize that when they were talking about securing the border, they're just talking about sending guys to one section? How many of you knew that? Not too many, how many of you didn't know that? There you go. A sea of hands. I'm going to assume that y'all did not raise your hands twice. I have this light in my face. But I saw a bunch of hands. So Laredo sector is one sector over. Okay? So when you're in the Laredo sector, man, or you're in the, the Rio Grande Valley sector, it looks good. There's DPS everywhere. God bless them. They're away from their families. I get it. I'm not criticizing the men and women in law enforcement. They're everywhere down there. It's great looking. It still isn't working, or Fal Furious wouldn't be so overwhelmed right now, which is the county north, right? Which is the station north. Let me tell you something. When you leave the Rio Grande Valley sector, you have roughly 70 some odd miles before you get to Laredo, the city of Laredo. That's in the Laredo sector, right? Guess how many, and y'all are gonna laugh at me who were on the trip. Yet when I first drove that, not the first time, when I first drove that after the law enforcement surge, guess how many state troopers I saw during that 70 some odd 80 mile stretch? Zero. 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 Guess how many National Guardsmen I saw, of course, zero. Guess how many Border Patrol agents, no offense to you guys, it's about how they're assigned. They've already spoken out and said 70% of them were taking care of unaccompanied minors and family units and not on the border. They've already spoke out about that, so I'm not blaming them, I'm blaming the government the different levels up top, and I'm blaming the state for not doing something about it. I drove that many miles on the border as a professional who knows what their, their air equipment looks like, who knows what all their stuff looks like, who knows, I drove that long without seeing security. That's not okay. I learned horrible things about that border in Laredo, which is immediately across from the Zetas territory. Horrible things. I called Julie. I called different leaders, and I said, we got to do something. So they got together, they went down there, they saw it. How many of you realize it's that bad? No. How many of you really know that it's that bad? I don't I see a couple hands. What's up? I see five, six hands. How many of you didn't know it was that bad? There we go. There. I'm disgusted. Totally disgusted. I understand. I understand that. I really do. So here's what we're going to do about it. You know? I have to ask you for some help, though. See, here's the thing. How many of you remember Andrew Breitbart? Remember? How many of you, how many 
of you remember that he found me very alone, fighting the New York Times and fighting all of left media who smeared me for something I didn't do, you know? I did something that I, at least I meant it as a service to the country. And I tried to keep people safe and I got attacked for it, you know? And I had no voice and I couldn't fight back and he found me and he wanted me to fight back and he said, hey, I'm starting this website and you ought to fight back with me. And I said, well, well that's not exactly how it went down. He actually called me because I bought a truck from one of his guys who went to college with a long story. And he, he gets how I got my number and he's like, why don't you fight back? I said, I do. And he said, well, I said, they don't print what I say, man. They don't print what I'm, my defense. They're, they're doing this, they're, they're, they're attacking me. And he said, well, I'm starting this website called Big Government and you can say whatever you want on my website. You can fight back. And this guy took me in and then he went around to this tea party movement and he asked you guys to like stick up for me, you know? And here I was, this former Black Panther radical leftist guy, you know? And you guys stuck up for me. The movement stuck up for me. And I think it's worked out for the movement. I fight for liberty pretty, pretty intensely, I think. So here's the deal. I'm going to ask of you something. I found these people who are getting attacked and being mistreated because they're doing the right thing. And that's these guys. That's the Border Patrol agents. And I want you to help me get our movement to support them. That's what I want from you. And I ask that as a friend, I ask that to some of you. Some of you I'm not friends with. Most of you I don't know really. But I know why you're here. I know a little about you. You wouldn't be here, right? And I ask that part of you to help us. Because these guys aren't treated right, man. You know, they had a situation where, you know, how many of you have ever heard of the ACLU? Right? <laughs> have you ever seen the stuff they say about these guys? Do you, do you really think that little kids are throwing pebbles at, at agents and agents shoot them dead? Do you really think that? You know? No. But that's what all the media was saying and they tried to get it with these guys. Listen to this. I'm not going to go too conspiratorial, but I'm going to tell you what. It seems to me like this administration and the left media, that the institutional left in the U.S. has done everything they can to keep our border open. Yeah. That's what I think. These guys who serve in the Border Patrol, okay, they try to say, like, we want them to live up to the same standards as other large police law enforcement agencies. Well, that sounds reasonable, right? But by standards, what they meant is they don't want them, they want them to have to follow the same rules and procedures as metropolitan police. How many of you think what an agent out there in the middle of nowhere with his radio oftentimes not working because of the lack of interoperability, which is another thing that this government does that really makes me mad. How many of you think that that agent should have to follow the same rules as a cop working in downtown Houston? How many of you think that that would work out? No. So what that means is if someone attacks them, they can't just go and deal with it. Or if they feel like there's a threat, they can't just go deal with it. They have to wait until backup arrives hours later. Does that make sense to you? So under the guise of, that sounded really clever, they tried to make it where these guys couldn't respond with force to rock attacks. So what we did is we published these photos with these agents with their faces caved in. These were little pebbles. These were like huge flagstones that these aliens were dropping on their heads from above them, thrown in their cars, destroying their faces, breaking their occipital bones, you know? And now what would have happened if these guys had not had the ability to defend themselves? Do you think that they would then go out to remote regions? No. Heck no. Would you? No. no. They wouldn't have. So what would that have left? Big open areas that people could just waltz right through, right? Yeah. So that's what they're dealing with. I'm going to ask you to help. Here's what we're going to do, in my opinion, what I really want you to participate in. We're going to take the Laredo sector. We're going to try to make sure that as many people as possible understand what's going on in the Laredo sector. If possible, can even see it with your own eyes to see what's going on in the Laredo sector. Okay? That's step one. Now, step two. Step one involves using the videos. We're going to pass it around the reports, talking, 
happy to tea parties. I don't charge. I'll pay for my own gas to come and see you and talk to your groups and your churches. I won't charge you a thing. Won't cost you a thing. I'll pay my own hotel. I'll do it every day I can except for the weekends I have with my daughter. But other than that, I'll be there. I promise. I'll tell what I know. We've got to get the word out. And we're going to get people down there to see it. And you're going to go home and tell everybody. And you're going to talk about the Laredo sector. Step two is not allowing our politicians, like the gentleman who was here earlier, or Rick Perry. I know some of you love him. I don't hate him. I'm not. But I'm going to tell you something. Or David Dewhurst or whoever. Don't allow them to blow snow in, or, or on the people of our state. Don't allow them to, to put wool over the eyes of our of Texans. They are not securing the border. They are talking about a small section, and they're doing it because it takes off the pressure from them to go up there and say, we're securing the border, we're sending a thousand National Guardsmen to the border, it's going to be secure, we'll do it ourselves. And then they walk off the stage. How many of you feel deceived to find out that that's the sector over and never, never was it mentioned out of Rick Perry's lips? Does that bother anybody? It bothers me. So step two is talking back and not letting them. You have to educate yourself, learn about it, see it with your own eyes, and then you have to fight back and talk to people and not let them pull this bull that they're pulling, because that's what it is. Now. These agents, I can always get a hold of them. If you want, I'll give you, I'll give you their home numbers and cell phone. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> no, when they speak and something's going on with their agents, step three, we have to magnify what their agents are going through and put pressure. Can Rick Perry change the reality of, of what Hector goes through when he's out there alone? Well, he can, he can, but let me tell you how he can. He can because he has a platform and he can tell the truth to people. You know, Burgess can tell the truth to people. You know, he, too many of us clapped when he was up here. And you know why? Because we didn't know, because he was, he was blowing smoke. Well, I don't know what that term is that's appropriate right now, but he was blowing smoke up our bottoms. That's what he was doing. We have smoky bottoms from our leaders. You know? We don't want to, we don't want to have conflict, some of us. We're like, our leaders are wrong. And it's like, no, name them. Call them out. Call them out for this stuff. So, once we are able, because here's the deal, the people in this room and a couple more groups like us, no politician on the, with an R after his name is going to get elected if we're all mad at him, let's be honest, right? It's very unlikely, unless it's Strauss, because he's, in, you know, very regional. Well, you know what I mean, you know, so, yeah. But that's, that's the deal. We have to organize and mobilize. We have to do it. We have to tell the truth, we have to get attitudes and talk back because people are lying in media and in government about what these guys go through, which affects us because it's our border and we're the ones who had, how many? Over 7,000 convicted sex offenders deported in the last three years in Texas alone. Did y'all know that? Yes. Yeah, you know, you're not, I reported that. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> That's what we're going to do. So once we get the Laredo sector, once we make sure that these men who are serving there are speaking for their brothers and sisters, once we make sure that they are taken care of, then what are we going to do? We're going to go to the Del Rio sector. And what are we going to do after the Del Rio sector? And we'll do the same thing. Then we're going to go to the Big Ben sector, right? And what are we going to do after the Big Ben sector? Yeah, then we're going to go to the El Paso sector. And then after the El Paso sector, which goes all the way through New Mexico, which you think might not affect you, but it does affect you. By then, we're going to have a whole bunch of people working together. What are we going to do after the El Paso sector? We're going to do the Tucson sector. And what are we going to, that's going to blow your minds too, by the way. What are we going to do after the Tucson sector? We're going to do the Yuma sector. You get it? You get where we're going? All the way to San Diego. That's how we're going to pull this off, people. Do you agree that if we just take one section and that God has given us, and I'm sorry, to, I'm, I mean, I smoke, I do all kinds of things, I curse, like Elder Fazer can tell you, he was on a road trip for a week. I'm like, so tuck me off, I don't know. You know, I said, get that story up. You know, I can freak out. I'm stressed out. I'm not trying to be a preacher, but I honestly think 
there's something ahead of us that we have to do, right, with our border for our, our safety, and not only our safety, but for the safety of all of those people in Central America that left of center Americans must not care about. Maybe they don't realize that their open border leads to women getting raped in Falfurias or that little boy who died on the border, right? Maybe they don't see the consequences of their bleeding hearts. I get it. I'm from there. I understand it. You know, I get it. But listen here, guys. We know what we have to do. And then God, that's why I said I smoke, so I don't want to be a hypocrite here. God provided us with a couple of men who we know have integrity, who serve our country, who are willing to speak out. And don't think they can talk about what's going on for the men and women they, they, they're representing in their sector, but don't think they can't get in trouble for how active they've been to oppose what's going on. They can. You know, all it takes is a bad leader up in management. Am I right? Yeah, some of the, some of the guys have actually been threatened. So think about this, guys. We're in a situation, we're all wondering what to do. Now we have a little glimpse of a plan, and then all of a sudden, we have two really good men with great character. Ones that I believe are heroes for what they do. And I think anybody else who walked out there in the Laredo sector in the middle of the night thinks they're heroes for going out there alone too, am I right? This is what we're going to do. I hope you're with me. I know that Julie's with me on it. I know these guys are with me. We're going to do everything we can to make sure that everything these men go through and that the men and women they serve with go through is known, it's, it can't be disputed, and we're going to do everything we can to hold any leader accountable who gets up on this stage or any stage and says something that isn't accurate. Okay? With that, I want to say thank you, and we're going to open up for Q&A.